In late 2018, Dragon Ball fans retreated to the 20th film in the franchise in the form of Dragon Ball Super Broly. Sporting not only some of the most gorgeous animation in the franchise's history, but the reintroduction and canonization of one of the franchise's most controversial characters. For decades, Broly has been derided by swaths of the fandom as being a boring meathead with poor motivations and even poorer characterization, with the most pervasive perception, and even official portrayals of him, being just a big dumb shouty boy whose voice box only seemed capable of screaming Kakarot between the shouts, grunts, and screams that are synonymous with Dragon Ball at large. To his fans, he was conceptually pretty fun if a bit overexposed. To his detractors, he was the embodiment of all of the franchise's faults distilled into a single character. So when the movie came out, there was a collective sigh of relief, as the new Broly was a significantly more interesting and sympathetic figure than his original incarnation. The fandom consensus was that this canon Broly was a breath of fresh air, that Akira Toriyama had turned lemons into lemonade, and that we could finally move past the dumb, tired, boring original version created by Takayo Koyama. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Well, here's the thing. While I am very firmly in the camp that adores the new Broly and holds him up as being better than the original incarnation in practically every way, I also feel that the hatedom for the original is a bit overblown in their distaste. Of course, I understand the general criticisms and that younger fans who loved the old version but may not necessarily be in the loop with online fandom discourse can certainly be grating with their surface level appreciation for him, but I also feel that perceptions of the original version of the character have been colored by pretty much all of his appearances in the franchise with one crucial exception, the original 1993 film. Don't misunderstand me. Most of the elements of the character a lot of fans hate do originate here, but there are also aspects that are basically dropped after this film. Subsequent depictions of him tend to draw more from the first sequel film, released in Japan in March 1994, where he pretty much is the big dumb shouty broccoli boy with a limited vocabulary that most view him to be. But more than that, the Broly hate-dom, at least as far as I've observed, also seems to look down on the original film, at least in some regard. Not nearly to the same degree as its two sequels, but to the point where discussion of the film rarely goes beyond the same few talking points about his motivations, Vegeta getting shafted, and, in the case of the dub, the soundtrack. And the wider fandom, at least here in the West, tends to land on it being a pretty middling movie, which I personally always found to be surprising. For years, over a decade even, I've regarded the original Broly as one of the best of the original 13 DBZ movies. There are those that come close, but Movie 8 stands above the rest in my eyes. And after literally 20 years of standing it, I think it's time I actually take the time to express why, exactly, I feel so strongly about this. Because, well, the movie is actually pretty good. Before we dive into this, I want to lay down a few guiding principles for this video. The crux of this analysis will be based primarily on the Japanese version of the film. I will discuss the Funimation dub and aspects pertaining specifically to it later. Unlike other videos of mine, I will not be diving into the movie's production history or background, nor limiting myself to contemporary points of comparison. I will, however, mostly be discussing the movie within the context of the Dragon Ball films released from 1986 to 1996. As such, direct comparisons to Super's version of Broly will not be part of this. And finally, I'll be looking at the movie as a movie, and not just a Dragon Ball movie. Now with all that being said, let's get started. So we all understand that the main appeal of Dragon Ball is the action, right? At least for most fans, the high-speed, high-concept fights are what keep them coming back. Seeing characters move faster than the speed of light, lob energy blasts, and throw punches that can shatter planets has the same spectacular appeal as professional wrestling for millions of people the world over. This is combined with a cast of characters who are varied but simple to grasp, as well as a continually escalating narrative which, while not particularly deep or complex, is carried by both its cast and the swerves in genre and tone brought on by Akira Toriyama's poor long-term planning, writing most of the manga by the seat of his pants, all the while holding the attention and interest of his readers and audience through impeccable melodrama. 
I'm not using that word as an insult, by the way. I love this franchise to bits, warts and all, and melodrama is exactly what it runs on. Its characters are highly exaggerated, and the most compelling parts of the story are tailor-made to hit those emotional sweet spots. Vegeta sacrificing himself to stop Boo, Goku seeing Grandpa Gohan at Baba's palace, Cell crushing Android 16's head and Gohan going Super Saiyan 2, literally all of Mr. Satan during the entire Boo saga. It's all incredibly histrionic, exaggerated, hyperbolic, melodramatic. And I and countless other fans wouldn't have it any other way. Of course, one of the biggest sticking points against the series is its length. The original manga has over 500 chapters, and the anime, not including GT or Super, has 444 episodes between Dragon Ball and Z. Not nearly as much as One Piece, but it's still a sizable time investment. And while binge-watching the original Dragon Ball is a pretty good time, watching Z can be an absolute slog because of the quite frankly ludicrous amount of filler and padding. Thankfully, we have Kai to cushion the blow as it cuts down on this and reduces Z's episode count from 291 to 166. Seven, all killer, no filler, as they say. But there are times when you want your Dragon Ball fix, but don't want to dedicate the time to watching multiple episodes or watch an entire story arc play out. So you turn to the next best thing, the movies. The majority of the DBZ movies are quick, self-contained slugfests which have no bearing on the main story. Of the 13 Dragon Ball Z movies released between 1989 and 1995, only three of them actually hit the one-hour mark. The average runtime is only 52 minutes, which roughly equates to about two and a half episodes of the show, not counting redundant OPs, credits, recaps, or next episode previews. Perfect for a quick fix. But to be blunt, most of these movies are pretty light on anything besides the action. The villains tend to be pretty flat, the actual plots tend to be paper thin for the sake of getting to the action quickly, and from there it usually goes through the motions of action rest, action rest, action climax. There are exceptions, of course. I'd say movie 13, Wrath of the Dragon, is much more focused on the relationship between Trunks and original character Tapion, but the back half still falls into largely the same rhythm as the others. For many fans, this rhythm is not only fine, but welcomed. Seeing these characters fight with more crisp, detailed animation when the animation is actually more detailed and crisp looking at you, Return of Cooler, is a big draw, and I respect that. I'm not immune to the dazzling allure of slick animation. But I feel that there was often a lot of potential being left on the table with these movies. They mostly feel like they were just churned out using existing blueprints for plots and characters, coupled with a surface-level spectacle for the sake of having a movie. Goku fights Frieza's brother! Hey, it looks like Dr. Jiro had a few extra androids! See Goku and Vegeta do the fusion dance! And of course, there's the subject of this video. Come see the true legendary Super Saiyan. Despite them often having pre-existing blueprints, however, a lot of DBZ movies tend to have pacing problems. This usually stems from a lack of variety in what's actually happening moment to moment. Movie 12, Fusion Reborn, for example, despite being upheld as a fan favorite from the original 13, is one of the more guilty subjects of this. Before too long, the film devolves into just a bunch of action scenes with slices of comedy while the ultimate goal remains the same, defeat Janemba. Yes, it's cool and exciting when Gogeta finally makes his appearance at the very end, but we just had to sit through, what, 35 minutes of Goku and Vegeta getting curb stomped while their kids fight endless hordes of Nazi zombies? And this movie's only 51 minutes long, it doesn't even hit the average. Gogeta's only in the movie for two of those minutes, and has just as many lines of dialogue, not counting a brief chuckle. Ultimately, it's not the runtime of a movie that affects the pacing so much as how that time is used. The length and order of those scenes, as well as simple changes to aspects of those scenes, such as dialogue or the score, can have a massive effect on pacing as well as tone. And most of these movies are just protracted action scenes with short breaks to give the audience a moment to breathe while maybe, sometimes, shifting focus to an ancillary goal. Movie 5 sees Goku taken out of commission during his first fight with Cooler, so Gohan has to to stealthily journey to Korin's tower to get some senzu beans for him. It's a welcome break from the action while still maintaining
maintaining tension, and I appreciate it. But then there are those scenes in the sequel where most of the characters are being shuffled along inside a processing plant looking confused, while Goku and Vegeta fight Metacooler, which doesn't really add much and act more as pacebreakers than anything. Movie 8 is one of the more unique entries in the series in this regard. Not only does it have the longest runtime of its ilk, clocking in at 72 minutes, but the first half of it hardly features any action. Instead, time is taken to establish the premise, introduce our villains, their goal, the conflict that arises from it, and, of course, the tone. I find that Movie 8 is one of the few that adopts a darker, more foreboding tone, specifically one with an air of mystery that aims to keep viewers slightly on edge as the story unfolds. It isn't unique in that sense, as both Movies 9 and 13 have similar sensibilities. Part of the atmosphere of Movie 8 does come from the visuals, the drab tones in the painted backgrounds and blue highlights and black hair to help define a character's outline in darkness go a long way, but neither of these elements are exclusive to this film. Pick a DBZ movie at random and chances are are that you'll get one that does a great job in establishing its tone through darker or muted colors. Rather, the uneasiness that the movie seeks to invoke, and in my opinion does so fairly well, comes from the framing and, more importantly, the pace at which new information is revealed to the audience. As previously stated, the film is 72 minutes long with hardly any action in the first half, and the iconic upward panning shot of Broly's legendary Super Saiyan form is just before the 37 minute mark, after which the movie falls back on the aforementioned action, rest, action, rest, action climax rhythm that's expected of it. But leading up to Broly's transformation is a gradual buildup of questions from Goku and the other's perspective, and information from Broly's father, Paragus, who, as the villain who set the story in motion, knows more about what's going on than anybody else, and keeps his cards close to his chest. There's more going on here than in your typical DBZ movie. It's complex, but not complicated. The first half keeps the viewer engaged through a steady stream of new information, which builds on or leads one to question the validity of previous information. Paragus looks a bit sketchy when we first see him, but his tone makes him seem genuinely pious towards Vegeta. But then Trunks and the others look around outside the Grand Palace he's built, and there's basically nothing but ruins, not to mention the palace seems to have been built with slave labor. And the slave's home was attacked by a Super Saiyan? Well, isn't that odd? But Goku, who's been following the Super Saiyan's key, quickly determines that it isn't Paragus, which the slaves confirm. By the 26 minute mark, the viewer is made privy to just about everything, with the notable exception of the significance of Comic Gomori, which is made clear before the action really gets underway. Even Broly's status as the legendary Super Saiyan is all but confirmed at this point. For those unaware, this is called dramatic irony, wherein the audience's knowledge of what's happening in a story exceeds the knowledge held by the characters within that story. This is to create a sense of anticipation in the viewer, who is assumed to want the characters to be brought into the loop and see how they react to information that has been withheld from them. How are they going to react? Will their goals change with the acquisition of this new knowledge? How will it affect them personally? And this is basically the only DBZ movie that employs this storytelling device. The one exception is its sequel, Broly's Second Coming, where its use doesn't really make a tangible impact on the narrative, but we're here to talk about the original movie and not its sequels. Of course, being a non-canonical film that exists more or less in its own bubble, we know that the characters won't be affected in a deep or profound way that would continue for the rest of their lives. Lives, but this doesn't necessarily lessen the utility or impact of dramatic irony. After all, it's a tool, one which is used pretty well in this movie. And if you want to argue that the English title or promotional materials completely give the game away, then consider this. The film itself doesn't frame Broly as an out-and-out -out antagonist until nearly 21 minutes in, when he first encounters Goku. It's only after this that we're treated to his and Paragus's backstory, and even though Broly is the one doing all the fighting, it was Paragus who incited the main conflict and got the plot rolling in the first place. Despite being the headliner for the movie, Broly kind of isn't really the main villain. Paragus is. At least until Broly kills him when he tries to escape the planet. But when discussing information held by the audience that's unknown to the characters, there's a specific bit of info that can't go unmentioned when talking about Broly, both the movie and the character. And that's his motivation. For decades now, the character has been derided for having a pathetically flimsy motive for wanting to kill Goku. That baby Kakarot cried too much, and it upset baby Broly, and that's why as an adult Broly has a serious grudge against Goku. I'm not here to argue that this is a good motive for the character because it isn't. 
It's ridiculous, even if you run with the idea that Broly's tremendous power dealt him some psychological damage or whatever. However, I am here to argue against this being Broly's definitive motive. For decades, I've been in the same boat as everyone else regarding his motives, but when I was writing this script, I happened upon a post from a user named Broly Kale on the Dragon Ball Wiki that posited another theory. I won't be reiterating the whole post, so I do recommend reading it for yourself if you're interested. The link is in the description. Firstly, I would like to make clear that I understand why this is almost universally accepted to be the source of Broly's malice towards Goku. The way the film is framed and edited certainly leans towards this. The close-up of baby Broly crying shortly after the medical staff points out that Kakarot is upsetting him dissolves into a medium shot of Broly as an adult in visible distress following his brief encounter with Goku. And the dub goes a bit further with this, moving some dialogue around and having the mention of baby Broly crying be spoken on the actual shot of him crying, a shot which originally had no dialogue in the Japanese version. Dissolving between these images implies a correlation, and sticking to descriptive dialogue on top of the first reinforces the connection in the Funimation dub. In fact, I think it's fair to say that the majority of English-speaking fans are basing their thoughts on the character and the movie as a whole on the dub. It's understandable. I've been watching the dub for 20 years now. But there's a minor alteration to some of Paragus's inner monologue in the dub that completely omits his own theory about Broly's aggression towards Goku. Specifically, he thinks that Goku's power may have roused Broly's say in bloodlust. For reference, this is what it was changed to in the dub. Something must be disturbing him, interrupting my control. His Saiyan rages flared the minute he saw Kakarot. These outbursts have to stop especially in front of our visitors. While a hint of the original meaning is still there, noting that Broly's Saiyan rage flared upon seeing Goku is certainly not the same thing as thinking that his instincts kicked in by sensing Goku's ki. And to kind of support Paragus' theory, we can look to their first meeting, where both Broly and Goku's respective powers are visualized to the audience in a way that's distinct from the franchise's iconic ki auras. They envelop the characters, but they aren't raging or flame-like. They merely exist around them, calmly, as though these are the auras they each naturally exude outside of battle, and Broly's fades as Paragus gets him under control, which further suggests that this calmer and more abstract aura represents Broly and Goku's natural instincts as Saiyans, and Paragus is suppressing Broly's. Adding on to this, when Broly is fighting everyone later, his dialogue, while antagonistic, isn't actively hateful towards anyone. He's not just a dumb brute, he's fully cognizant. He even compliments them on their tenacity, saying that they really are Saiyans. <laughs> Whereas in the dub... You're all complete and utter waste of Saiyan blood! He is still trying to kill them, of course, and is savagely malicious with his intentions, but there's no targeted malice. He's just reveling in the carnage because it's what he enjoys. Broly is, for good or for ill, a distillation of Saiyan bloodlust, someone who lives for battle and destruction. Grudges are seemingly beneath him. That's all well and good, but then there's the ending to consider. When Goku lands the final blow, which is implied to be where Broly was stabbed as an infant and thus a weak spot, in case you couldn't piece that together, why do we briefly flash back to the nursery? Well, Broly Kale posits that this is meant more to reflect the thematic relationship between Goku and Broly. When they were born, Broly's power level of 10,000 was far greater than Kakarot's measly power of 2. Yet despite this gap in power, Kakarot was able to disturb the far more powerful Broly. At the end of the movie, Goku, despite being completely outmatched, is able to bring down the Goliath legendary Super Saiyan. With the ending in mind, the nursery flashback can then be viewed as foreshadowing that Goku will defeat Broly, as opposed to a revelation for why Broly supposedly hates Goku. Just as well, Paragus' inner monologuing earlier in the film seems to allude to this thematic throughline. <laughs> Does all of this make Broly a better or more interesting character? Maybe not in any significant way, but it certainly makes him seem less ridiculous on a conceptual level. If anything, it makes the movie itself far more interesting from a filmmaking perspective. There was some serious consideration made regarding the editing and shot composition to give actual interior meaning through the use of visual language. 
However, the more ambitious nature of Movie 8 doesn't preclude it from being flawed. As I've stated before, after Broly transforms, it basically goes back to the rhythm expected of a DBZ movie. Though even here, the movie does change things up a bit, using the comet as a ticking clock to compound the more immediate threat of Broly himself. As Comet Gamori draws nearer, it begins to dominate the sky above, alter the landscape, and weaken the earth beneath the character's feet. Between the effect it's having on the planet and the hope that comes from everyone channeling their key into Goku, the climax is one of the more exciting and tense of the film series. Vegeta's reticence to lend his key plays a major part in this, letting his pride get the better of him like he is wont to do. And this is where we have to talk about how Vegeta is used for the bulk of the runtime. He's the target of Paragus' animosity, and the plot revolves around his scheme to kill the Saiyan Prince for what his father, King Vegeta, had done to him in Broly. He plays to Vegeta's ego to get him to come along for the ride, telling him he's the only one who can stop the legendary Super Saiyan, and Vegeta sticks with this modus operandi for most of the runtime, until he actually sees Broly transform and he's paralyzed with fear. Aside from Broly himself, a lot of the criticism levied towards this movie is aimed at Vegeta, whether it be for Broly's animosity not being directed towards him like it is for his father, or for Vegeta's cowardice for most of the actual fight. I don't think it's worth touching on the former here since we've already gone over the more substantiated motivation for Broly, but the latter… well, I'm of two minds about it. On the one hand, yes, Vegeta acting this way is extremely out of character for him, and feels very wrong. On the other hand, someone with such defining character traits acting against what's expected of them is a simple and effective way of communicating the gravity of a situation. Reducing the normally arrogant Vegeta into somebody paralyzed with fear, in awe of Broly's tremendous power for a chunk of the runtime, is effective in this regard. Maybe, from a creative standpoint, this was done to try and continually escalate the fight with Broly, like how Piccolo was brought into the fold, while also giving Paragus somebody to monologue towards for a bit longer. Considering that the latter is how we get the final pieces of Broly and Paragus' backstory, those which pertain to his revenge plot, it's not far out of left field, but that doesn't make Vegeta's cowardice any easier to accept. It's hard for me to call this a flaw, despite my own personal misgivings with it, but it's probably the biggest gripe I have with the movie personally. Just about everything else in the movie works surprisingly well. However, the caveat here is that I've been talking about the Japanese version, and while that's obviously not a bad thing in and of itself, it's not the version I'm most familiar with. But now, after having watched this version, I'm at a bit of an impasse when it comes to the Funimation dub. Like most of you, I saw Funimation's English dub first. I've been watching it for 20 years now, and can't tell you enough how difficult it is for me to discuss it without letting my nostalgic bias show. And after watching the Japanese version and re-examining Broly's character through that version, my feelings have only gotten more complicated. I'm going to say some things that'll be sacrilege to a lot of people, but I'm here to speak my truth. First and foremost, the dub moves around some dialogue and information and changes some ancillary lines completely, as well as clumsily omitting Paragus' theory about Broly being incensed by Goku's key. Aside from that last thing, it's mostly nothing too crazy, but revealing that the comet is going to destroy the planet when its existence is first revealed to the audience is certainly a choice. As far as when the dub was produced, it was probably around this point when the Funimation cast were starting to really get comfortable in their roles, having wrapped up DBZ proper and getting underway with GT. The performances from the regular cast are pretty solid throughout, with the two standouts in the film being Damian Clark, voice of Cell and future Gohan, as Paragus, giving a slight gravel to his voice that lends an air of weariness to the character, and Vic Mignogna in what was at the time a surprising turn as the titular Broly. But if you really want a feel for when this dub was made, then you'd best listen to the soundtrack. Like with the rest of DBZ and the movies, Funimation replaced Shunsuke Kikuchi's score with their own soundtrack. The series itself had Bruce Falconer and his team orchestrating new tracks, while the movies had a grab bag of composers with their own original compositions and licensed music from actual rock and metal bands of the time, mostly those local to the Dallas area. The incidental music for the Broly dub was composed by Mark Menza, who also composed the dub score for GT, and boy does it show at times. What? Let's get you back to the palace, my son. Hmm. 
<laughs> this early, long-abandoned practice from Funimation has been endlessly derided by hardcore fans. Obviously, there are still those who prefer the Falconer score for the series, and while I do like the Falconer score at times, the biggest downside to it is how incessant it is. Kikuchi's score, while perhaps a bit goofy to some, at least wasn't always playing. There were moments of silence and ambience to build tension. While the dub of the show itself always has music playing, as the movies went on, Funimation pulled back on this a bit. There aren't as many moments of ambience in this movie's dub as there were in the Japanese version, but there are enough to demonstrate a level of restraint. But I'm sure this isn't what a lot of you want me to talk about regarding the dub soundtrack, is it? If you like the music from Dragon Ball Z's Broly, the legendary Super Saiyan. You all want me to rip into the licensed songs used throughout the movie, talk about how ill-fitting they are, and how sometimes you can't even hear the dialogue over screeching vocals, don't you? Well, guess what? I actually really like the dub soundtrack. Hear me out on this. Yes, the dub soundtrack is in a completely different universe compared to the original Kikuchi score, both in their use and in tone. And while I won't argue that it's necessarily better than the original, I will say that criticism levied towards it, like the movie itself, is a tad overblown. Vocals are often edited out when there's dialogue, so there's no difficulty in understanding the latter. And when that's not the case, the music is mixed in a way that vocals clashing with dialogue still isn't an issue, at least to me. Tonally, I don't find the hard rock and metal to be ill-fitting, and that's mostly down to Broly himself. Look at him, he's built like a refrigerator, and moves and attacks like a pro wrestler, with body slams and clotheslines galore. This kind of music wouldn't be out of place in something like a WWE match, and neither would Broly, at least in terms of physicality. There's also how often the music tends to flow with the scene. Boys Like Girls Steal by Slow Roosevelt matches up so well to the action on screen, from the buildup of the drums to when the full band crashes in when Broly dives into the mattress. The timing, at least here, is just perfect. But I will absolutely cop to my adoration for this soundtrack being down to a combination of personal taste and nostalgia. Like I said, I've been watching the dub for this movie for almost 20 years now. I still have my original VHS copy of the edited cut, just without the trading cards. I grew up with this soundtrack, and it did kind of help to shape my taste in music. I've listened to several of the bands and albums advertised at the start of the tape and promoted on the DBZ website at the time. Dusu's Aqua Vita became one of my all-time favorite albums after I sat down to listen to it past the opening track which was featured in the movie. It's the only album I have on vinyl, and I will never not recommend listening to it in full. For nearly 20 years, I've watched and adored the Funimation dub of this movie, but after sitting down to watch the original Japanese version all these years later… well… I'm conflicted. It's still a comforting piece of media for me, but between the knowledge I've now gained from watching the Japanese version, and things that have since happened in real life surrounding the movie and the character, I find it difficult, if not outright impossible, to engage with it the way that I used to. Like I said, I originally watched the edited version of the dub on VHS. Now I watch the uncut DVD, and I'm still taken back a bit when I see the stuff that was edited out. Roshi being drunk rather than space sick, Broly licking a bit of blood off his chin, the dagger actually piercing baby Broly. I know it was always supposed to be there, but it still feels so off to me. And that's to say nothing of Broly's voice actor, Vic Mignogna, who once was an exceptionally prolific name in anime dubbing, but whose inappropriate conduct with fans and other cast members would ultimately result in him being blacklisted from the industry. As a result, when I watch this movie now, Broly's voice actor being a sex pest is always floating in the back of my mind. And then of course there's the new movie, which reworked and canonized the character to the praise of fans, myself included. Like I said at the start, it's a better movie than the original in basically every way, but its existence leaves fans little reason to go back to the original because… well, it's neither canon nor is good. And that's to say nothing of how Second Coming and other media, mainly video games, had flanderized the character so badly that most fans can only see him in the simplistic, dumbed-down way he's portrayed in those. 
The original Broly movie is being left behind, not in terms of availability, but in terms of relevance. In a way, that's been happening since its sequel was released in 1994 in Japan. And while I'm glad the character's gotten a second chance and been made into someone fans can unironically love without ridicule, I still have a soft spot for the original screamy Broccoli Man and his first appearance. And I think that, even with the new Broly around, it's still worth a watch for any Dragon Ball fan.